Good afternoon. My name is Sofia Vostrakova. I am a fifth-year student in the Department of Special Life Support Systems, specializing in refrigeration and cryogenic technology. Until recently, Russia actively collaborated with European countries in the creation of space projects, which are currently suspended. In this regard, I have a question, are there plans to resume these projects, and how important is Russia's participation in international space programs? You probably understand even better than I do how crucial cooperation is in such a complex, science-intensive field as space, where every millimeter is saturated with ideas and modern technologies. Russia has been actively engaged, first the Soviet Union in its time, and then Russia actively began interacting with partners. Until recently, we worked with the Europeans as well. As you said, the cooperation has been suspended, but you didn't mention on whose initiative. Not ours, but the Europeans. By the way, with the Americans, our space cooperation continues. Despite everything, it all continues. But the Europeans decided to suspend it. That's their choice. But do you know what demonstrates just how important this is, both for us and for our partners? The fact that, even though our European partners have stopped cooperating with us, practically reducing it to zero, Russian equipment is still operating on their stations, on their facilities, including, I believe, in Mars exploration projects, and so on. That is, what we created, whether we did it alone or jointly, everything is still working. That means it's important for them too. They terminated the cooperation, but they didn't remove the devices. The devices are still functioning. As for cooperation with other countries, with the United States, as I said, it continues, and Roscosmos remains in contact with NASA. Back in, what was it, 1975? The first docking took place, Soyuz 19, or which Soyuz was it, and Apollo. And since then, cooperation began, which later evolved into the International Space Station. This work continues. We are, I repeat, in contact with NASA. By the way, when Soyuz Apollo docked, I believe it was in 1975. There's a very interesting moment there. Maybe you know about it, but if not, I'll tell you. It was planned that the docking would occur over Moscow. In reality, it actually happened over the Elbe. Exactly 30 years before that, Soviet and American troops had met there, dealing the final blow to Nazi Germany. And exactly 30 years later, in 1975, the docking of Apollo and Soyuz took place right over the Elbe. Since then, the International Space Station has been created and is operational. Now there are all sorts of ideas about how it should conclude its work, what we should do next. But the work will undoubtedly continue, I am sure, including with new partners. We have major plans with the People's Republic of China, interesting, good and grand ones, and with BRICS countries in general, India, South Africa, Brazil. <coughs> This cooperation is not stopping and cannot stop, because many countries are interested in this collaboration. Especially since we were, and in many areas still remain, leaders. That means we are of interest to our partners. I am confident it will remain so. I would like to ask a follow-up question on the topic of international cooperation. I am Artem Ekler, a second-year student in the Department of Spacecraft and Launch Vehicles, founded by Sergei Pavlovich Korolev. I am an active member of the Youth Space Center and dream of working on a manned mission to Mars after graduating from university. Do you think I will have such an opportunity? Are there plans to create such a project in Russia? You know, there's a man in the United States, Musk, who, one might say, is obsessed with Mars. Such people don't appear often in the human population, those driven by a specific idea. 
Even if it seems incredible today, over time, such ideas often come to fruition. Just as, in their time, the ideas of Korolev and our other pioneers were realized. Some of the plans they envisioned seemed impossible, yet they all came to pass. The Mars mission project is extremely complex, and today it seems very difficult to implement. If you're interested, you surely know this. The first challenge to solve is ensuring the long-term and safe presence of humans in space, not just in near space, but in deep space, because the intensity, degree, and power of radiation, there are entirely different. Second, we need to address new methods of transmitting information. This is extremely important. Third, we must ensure energy supply for future facilities, including those humanity plans to establish in relation to Mars. But overall, of course, this is a monumental and fascinating challenge. I am confident it will gather more and more supporters over time. We, too, have certain plans for exploring deep space, both the Moon and Mars. Let me remind you that we were once the first to achieve an automated landing on a planet with temperatures of 400 to 500 degrees Celsius, yet it was accomplished. It may seem unbelievable, but many such projects eventually come to fruition. I believe this one will too, in the end. In Soviet times, there was a very popular song, and apple trees will bloom on Mars. I don't know about apple trees, but in general, this is certainly something humanity will strive for. It's wonderful that you're already thinking about this and planning your involvement. Today, right now, in fact, we will discuss Roscosmos development plans, our space activities, and we'll touch on deep space as well. I actually have a follow-up question on the topic of Mars exploration. I'm a student in the Department of Plasma Power Systems, and I'm extremely interested in this field. Like many Bauman University students, I'm inspired by deep space exploration. It seems to me that plasma propulsion systems could make this process much faster and more energy efficient. Vladimir Vladimirovich, could you please tell us whether there will be support in the coming years for developing plasma propulsion projects, and whether there will be international cooperation in plasma science? In this field, we are undoubtedly leaders, though we could have and should have achieved much more by now. We could have done so if we had worked on this topic more purposefully. If you're interested in this, you surely know that these ideas originally emerged back in the 1960s, associated with the three Ks, Keldish, Korolev and Kurchatov. They worked on this, and we have solid groundwork. Of course, when we talk about deep space, we remain attractive to potential partners precisely because we have such developments. The exhaust velocity of this fuel is dozens of times faster than that of thermal devices, other power systems, or electric engines. This is highly promising, both for propulsion and as an energy source for deep space projects. It's one of the most forward-looking directions. Without it, deep space exploration would hardly be possible. And this is our competitive advantage. We'll discuss this today as well. Following up on the project, I'd like to ask a question. My name is Veronica. 
I'm currently a postgraduate student and head of the Space Technology Direction at the Skunk Works of Bauman Moscow State Technical University. Since childhood, I've dreamed of working in astronautics, and now I finally have that opportunity here. In parallel, I'm developing the Zoryanka Compact Descent Capsule Project, which will promptly deliver various experiments both from orbital stations and low Earth orbits. The Russian orbital station currently under development is particularly interesting for conducting experiments in polar orbits. In this regard, my question is, do you believe it's possible to fully integrate student-led initiatives into both the Russian orbital station project and Russian cosmonautics as a whole? Not just possible, it's essential. But of course, these projects must be competitive preferably a step ahead. We now have design bureaus established in over 70 federal subjects, 76 I believe, and in more than 200 universities. There are already around 600 of these design bureaus, though the exact number might be known to the rector. Through these structures, it's entirely possible to propose your developments and solutions, but they must, I repeat, be competitive. Just now, I was speaking with a colleague who mentioned navigation elements. I asked him, what's their accuracy? He replied, several dozen meters. Ideally, though different instruments serve different purposes, it should be down to one meter. That's crucial. The same goes for other parameters. Perhaps in this case, we were discussing different objectives, but I use this as an example. Everything must be competitive. Given Bauman University's capabilities, I believe achieving this competitiveness is entirely possible. We will actively support the realization of your ideas, both now and in the future. There's no need to wait until the Russian station becomes operational.